So what's your idea of a fun Friday afternoon? Around here, it's updating an identifier listing. That's one of the realities of weather forecasting, having to keep track of WMO and ICAO identifiers. And that's how we can be sure we're getting all of the available weather data since stations are frequently changing. Well, we might as well start out with the Arctic regions. Let's outline that region of minus 30. Well, there it is. I'm not sure if it's expanded much from yesterday, but it certainly comes south in this area here. So minus 30 is all the way down to northern Saskatchewan. And we've got minus 50s appearing in a few regions, the Brooks Range in Alaska, and of course, northern Victoria Island. But you can see the 1044 millibar high there. That's in a very typical place for cold air outbreaks. And the bulk of it extends all the way down to the Canadian prairies and up to the Arctic ice pack. A little further to the southeast, blizzard conditions. Look at that, minus 35 with 30 knot winds gusting to 35. That would certainly kill you if you were out there in it. And that's being caused by this bear clinic system out there near Coral Harbor. And we've got this vast plume of warm advection coming up into Quebec and Baffin Island. Temperatures 23 degrees above zero. So that's very warm air for this time of year. And of course, we need to go further south. This is the leading edge of the Arctic outbreak. I did carry this as modified continental polar air because I don't think that true Arctic characteristic is in it. And these temperatures in North Dakota and Minnesota, they're still above zero. That's not severely cold. However, it does represent a vast volume of cold air on its way south, and you can see those strong westerly winds already getting established around the Twin Cities, down to Madison, Milwaukee, and Chicago, where it's 13 degrees with a west wind. And then dropping further south, quiet conditions in the southern U.S., there's that first polar outbreak. The leading edge is starting to stall along the Gulf Coast region, warm front coming up into the Carolinas. And you can see that there's not much push on it with this weak 1017 millibar high centered in Mississippi. If that was a stronger push of cold air, we would probably have a large high across Texas, Colorado, and New Mexico. Out to the west, a lee side trough there in Colorado, New Mexico. Very mild conditions with upper 30s and 40s. And then as we go west, we get into some of that ridging along the west coast with a Pacific air mass filtering into California, Nevada, and the southwestern U.S. Now a great way to look at this air mass is with cross sections. We're going to do a cross section starting from the Arctic regions in the heart of that cold air all the way down through the intrusion into the north central U.S. and then down to the southeastern U.S. where we have that triple point and the tropical air just to the south. So in tropical tidbits what we do is we hold down control and drag the mouse and that gives us a selection box so I'm going to do the normal wind since the jet stream is mostly flowing west to east and that gives us our resulting cross section there we can see the main polar front jet over the Carolinas Georgia Florida and the leading edge of the front running something like that right there and then further up to the north we catch that Arctic blast coming into the north central U.S. And keep in mind that we're looking at a cross section extending from the ground all the way up to about 50,000 feet. These black lines are potential temperature. It's basically the temperature at each level corrected to just above sea level. So that removes some of the adiabatic effects. And the potential temperature always rises with height. 
We don't need to get too much into why that is. But where you have tight packing, like right here, that indicates a weak lapse rate, an isothermal layer, or an inversion. And where they're spread far apart in the vertical, that indicates more of an unstable layer, more of a steep lapse rate. And it makes sense where you have a front setting like that, there's going to be kind of a suppressed lapse rate, kind of an inversion maybe. And then above that, we would find more unstable conditions. So in fact, I can go ahead and put a sounding right in this area, and we'll look at that profile. And you can see that the tropopause is lower back in this region. There's that packing very close together. That's what we tend to find in the stratosphere. And notice closer to the jet, the stratosphere is at a higher level. So we need to do 44 by 96. So we'll just go over to pivotal weather. 44 by 96 is going to be right around here. We'll pull up that sounding. And you can see that we're catching the Arctic air mass top right about there. That's up at about six or 7,000 feet, which is fairly deep. And then further up, we've got the steeper lapse rate. And this is all modified polar air from the first outbreak that came through a couple days ago. And all through the column, the winds are northwest. And you can see that low tropopause right there at about 25,000 feet. So if you're flying from Boston to Seattle up at this level, you're going to be getting a little bit extra ozone with your cabin air. And something I often like to do is to construct multiple cross sections. That way I can get a better picture of the air mass. For example, here I can see an inversion up at about five to 6,000 feet. And that looks to be over the Great Lakes, maybe in Wisconsin. And that looks to be back in, yeah, around Thunder Bay. And there it is, the top of the frontal inversion from that Arctic outbreak. And we can also bring it straight south from the Northwest Territories down through Colorado and New Mexico. And it gives us a slightly different picture because it catches the Rocky Mountains in Colorado and New Mexico. So yeah, the jet's right over that. And right there, I think that's going to be the Arctic front. And then in Colorado itself, you can see the contribution to the jet from the other front down further south. So it appears once you get aloft, you do find that old stationary front across the southwestern U.S. And if we bring up a sounding in that area, we can see that isothermal layer from the ground up to about 18,000 feet. And that's a result of the tail end of that first cold air outbreak that came through. So obviously, by the time we get to the thickness and pressure chart, we've got a very good idea of how the air mass is constructed. And we see that thickness packing from the Gulf Coast all the way back towards Nevada and Utah. And that's that front that we picked up on that last cross section. And the surface front would actually be down in this region right here. So that means we may want to go back and correct this chart and bring that old stationary front up into Arizona, something like that. And we do see that there is a little bit of residual northerly flow in the California deserts. And then looking at the current station plots, yeah, there's that northerly flow there in Arizona. But it looks like there's this stronger burst of northwesterly flow. This could be indicating a new cold front or frontogenesis, one of the two. And that strong wind regime extends all the way back towards Idaho. Now, it is tricky finding the support for that on the thickness chart, but I do see a little bit of ridging right there and a little bit of packing right there in the thickness field. And that would suggest to me a cold front oriented something like that. 
and I think that actually may connect back up into that Colorado, New Mexico four corner system. So we got to crack the chart a little bit more. So I think it actually looks a little bit like that. There's a fresh cold air outbreak. It's not really reflected very well by the pressure field. In fact, it's got ridging right down the cold front. And we're not seeing much of a surface low right there. But this is a pattern that could quickly evolve. And we may start to see cyclogenesis along that wave. But that wave is certainly there. And that could have potential downstream over the next day or two. And here's what I'm referring to. Let's check out that Four Corners area into tonight. See how these thickness patterns kind of pack together. And we see kind of a generalized low pressure area. And looks like it shifts into the Albuquerque area this evening. So this is probably very fast moving and more of a re reflection of a fast-moving upper-level system. Because by tomorrow morning, it's already emerging there into Texas, and we get a low developing around Childress. And then you can see that evolving, and then picking up steam as it moves east towards Mississippi and Alabama. And there it goes. So that's the kind of stuff you have to watch for when you analyze these charts. And I think this was a really good example. So you may not have caught that system if you did not do a thorough surface analysis, if you did not do a cross-section. However, what if you looked at the heights and vorticity chart? Well, it looks uh, like something's going on there in Washington. Let's bring that up to the current time. Well, it's actually almost 21Z, but this correlates to the surface chart, and that's a short wave right there in Idaho. And remember, just ahead of it, we had those strong gusty winds and clouds. And if we consider the rule of thumb there, from the trough to the downstream ridge, which is kind of masked by the large-scale trough, we would expect to find a frontal wave just ahead of that. Maybe something like that. And if we bring this forward into tonight, you see it's heading for the Four Corners area. By midnight, it's in eastern New Mexico. And then by morning, we find it in Texas. Hmm. So now maybe you get an idea why forecasters like to refer to the heights and vorticity chart. That's one way of catching mid-level systems that may have an impact in the lower levels. Okay, here's the temperature and pressure for Sunday morning. Yeah, it's the weekend already. Well, we already have a pretty good idea what's going to happen. We went over these charts yesterday. You probably remember that. And there's those minus 50s up there in northern Saskatchewan. So I think the best way to get a handle on the forecast is to look at the changes in the model from yesterday to this morning. So we're going to look at five runs. And let me run this forward. That's yesterday's chart, and here's how it evolved to this morning. Not much difference. Still looks like a lot of cold air coming into the Chicago, Rockford, and Waterloo, I guess Ames, whatever, whatever towns those are in eastern Iowa. Okay, so Sunday is pretty cut and dry. Let's look at Monday. Well, here's how the picture looked Monday morning when we looked at it yesterday, and here's the change. Hmm, it was going for a little push of cold air into Kansas with that 0Z zero zero run, and then it backed off on that. So, looks like not a whole lot of change. Okay, so the forecast is pretty solid through Monday. Let's look at Tuesday. Here's yesterday's forecast, and remember we talked about that next wave coming through Texas on Tuesday morning and heading east and bringing cold air around the backside. Is that still going to be the case? Let's look at that wave and the push of cold air. And since we are dealing with forecast times much further into the future, there's going to be much more variability between the model runs. 
Okay, so that looks about the same. So things are on track, I think, for Tuesday. I would expect things to get a little bit sketchy towards Wednesday. Then for Wednesday, we've got the cold air coming into much of the country. Most of the problems are in Texas and Oklahoma. It looks like it backed off yesterday and then kind of put the cold air back this morning. That cold air is going to be surging into Washington, Vancouver, Spokane around midweek next week. And let's see how things look on Thursday. Well, on Thursday, we are getting into some discrepancies in the models. Yesterday, we had a 1050 millibar high coming down through Alberta. And let's run that forward. Looks like the 6Z model was kind of temperamental, kind of shrunk back on the cold air and then put it back. But a big change is up north in Canada. I don't know if you noticed, but there's that deep low pressure system up there in Manitoba, a strong high pressure out to the west. You can see it's not really sure what to do with that. And then for this morning, it kind of weakened both of those systems. And that means that the southward component is going to be a little bit weaker on that cold air. And I'm not sure what the effect on that's going to be. It may end up baking some more of that cold air up there in Canada and then bringing it south later that weekend. It's really hard to tell. And indeed, that does seem to be the case for Friday. You can see not a whole lot going on, just kind of a strong high out west. Not much going on in the prairies, just kind of a north flow. But for that 12Z run where things were weaker, look at that. It just drops some more cold air right there in Saskatchewan. And that's going to have to come south. So I don't think we're going to be done with this cold air until maybe the second half of February. And I think the saving grace is it is taking a long time to come south, so the effects down in the southern U.S. are not going to be quite as extreme since the air mass will have been undergoing modification as it comes south. And I think that's about all that needs to be said about this cold air outbreak. So we'll be back on Monday and we'll have a fresh look at what's happening. And it will be a very cold week in many parts of the country. All right, I hope you all have a great weekend. Remember, for our supporters, people like Zachary Bennett, Ron Chalfant, Jeff Erickson, Abe Moscow, Jason Rourke, Steve Witt, for those supporters, we will be back on Monday with the private forecast lab video. So if you're concerned about that Arctic air, you may want to sign up as a Patreon supporter. Here's how to do it and you'll get that Monday video. And for everybody else, we will see you on Tuesday. All right, have a great weekend. Until next time, bye-bye.